My name is Caitlin McNeil. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I uh, completed my practicum with the First Nations Health and Social Secretary to Manitoba. Um, so my project was titled Moving Toward Reconciliation in Healthcare, a proposed information sharing agreement between a First Nation and the government of Manitoba. Um, so I wanted to start by sharing a positionality statement. So like I said, my name is Caitlin. I'm a member of the Musagagan Cree Nation. I've been a registered nurse for nine years and I am the director of health services for the Opaskwak Health Authority. So right now I am in my office in the Opaskwak Cree Nation. Um, technically, I'm on my own traditional territory, the Swampy Cree um, area. But I'm from a reserve that's about an hour from here. Um, but I was actually told to stop saying I'm not from here because I've been here for a long time. <laughs> so I won't say that. <laughs> um, and so the focus of my project was uh, developing a modifiable template for an information sharing agreement between a First Nation and the government of Manitoba. Um, my project was inspired by my nine to five regular job. Um, access to data is something that I struggle with um, constantly um, in trying to plan services. So I'm gonna follow like a pretty standard research paper outline. Um, I just wanted to point out that the topics that I have to cover in order to provide the basis for the information sharing agreement are very complicated. So I could have done a talk on each specific one of them. Um, so the background is going to be quite lengthy. Um, and we haven't actually gotten to implementation. So um, it'll just be on the development process. Um, so Manitoba is home to 63 First Nations and has the highest proportion of First Nations people in Canada. There are five linguistic groups, the Cree, Anishinaabe, Oji Cree, Dene, and Dakota. Um, each First Nation is a sovereign state with a unique nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the government of Canada and a right to self-governance, including in the administration of their health services. Um, First Nations have fundamentally different perspectives of health, um, so it's holistic, it incorporates mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual wellness, and it's relational, so the health of the individual is intertwined with the well-being of their family, community, and natural environment. Um, because of this, the strategies made by First Nations to address negative outcomes are different than those that would be developed by Western professionals. Um, there's an ongoing reclamation of cultural practices and revitalization of the use of traditional medicines in communities. And there are numerous examples of healthcare excellence and innovation in First Nations across the province that I wish I could have shared, but I only have 10 minutes, so. Um, federal agreements and legislation pertaining to First Nations health. Um, so we're going to go all the way back to the beginning with the Indian Act, so that's 1876. Um, it was established that the federal government has a fiduciary responsibility for First Nations health services. Um, within Manitoba, there's a, a little bit of a, a unique situation with the Manitoba 1964 agreement. So they transferred responsibility for health services in five First Nations to Manitoba Health. Um, and that situation is ongoing. Like those communities are still under provincial responsibility to this day. Um, and so... Prior to 1979, there was a real lack of clarity on what that fiduciary responsibility that the government has is and what it means. Um, so in 1979, they came up with the Indian Health Policy to try to clarify the situation a little bit. Um, it provided the mandate for the First Nations Inuit Health Branch. Um, the document stated that First Nations were responsible for improving their own health, health outcomes, which completely disregarded the impacts of colonial policies and the legal responsibilities of the federal government. And then in 1989, um, FNIB implemented what's known as the health transfer policy. And so this facilitates the transfer of selected health services to First Nations to administer themselves. Um, it's a voluntary process. So this, you know, kind of worsened the confusion surrounding First Nations health services by creating three categories of communities. So there's non-transferred and non-integrated. So FNIB is still responsible for service administration there. Um, there's integrated, which is seen as an intermediary step between being non-transferred and transferred. And then obviously transferred is the third. Um, and theoretically, there's a fourth, but nobody has gotten there yet uh, as true self-governance. Um, but an actual fourth exists in Manitoba because of that 64 agreement. So that's those under provincial responsibility. Um, so transferred communities essentially have no access to local level administrative health data as members may not have access to primary care in their communities and they have to seek secondary and tertiary health services within provincial systems. 
Um, there are information sharing agreements between the provinces and territories and the government of Canada, but First Nations themselves are included in those excluded from those communication pathways. Um, these data are essential for service planning and advocating for equitable resources. So the current state in Manitoba as of March 31st, 2003, which is more than 20 years ago, um, that's the most recent data or information that's available. Uh, 33 First Nations were transferred at that point, four were integrated and 25 were listed as others. So that's 64 agreement and non-transferred communities, non-transferred, non-integrated. And so First Nations suffer significantly higher levels of morbidity and mortality, including from conditions where access to primary care could have been prevented or reduced the severity of illness. Many factors contribute. Um, so first there's resourcing far below that pro provided to other Canadians for health services. There's a lack of accessible and appropriate health services. Um, the impacts of colonialism. So that's things like residential schools, the 60 scoop racism, et cetera. And the fact that many determinants of health disproportionately negatively impact First Nations people. So that's, you know, access to clean drinking water, um, adequate housing, community infrastructure, et cetera. Um, and it's been found in the literature that the gap in health status between First Nations and all of the Manitobans is widening. Um, so facilitating access to health debt uh, will enhance the ability of First Nations to advocate for themselves and to build programs and services that meet their needs. First Nations data sovereignty. So First Nations data includes all of the individual and collective information pertaining to that nation. It can be cultural, administrative, research, survey, intellectual, historic, or contemporary. Um, it's governed by the OCAP principles of ownership, control, access, and possession. There are a lot of barriers um, right now. So nations lack access to their own information. This is something that I personally struggle with. I have requested different types of information from the federal government at different points um, and have been denied. Uh, there is an over collection of information by the government of Canada. Uh, First Nations data has been sold to third parties um, and data has been used by the Crown for its own purposes, which has perpetuated negative perceptions of First Nations people. So information sharing agreements. So these are legally binding agreements used to exchange information between government bodies or health data stewards. Um, as sovereign entities, First Nations have the legal authority to be parties to ISAs involving their information. Um, each nation would have to de develop their own ISA as they only have the legal authority to receive information for their own registered members. Um, an ISA is an appropriate mechanism to fac facilitate the ongoing cyclical sharing of needed information. There are numerous examples of provinces partnering with First Nations by linking Indian registry information with their administrative databases, but none of them are in Manitoba. And usually they're at um, a higher scale or level than the local level. Um, but unfortunately, like this is the level that advocacy needs to happen at um, because each community receives their own unique funding from the federal government directly. Um, but on the positive side, Manitoba has demonstrated their openness to this type of agreement by partnering with Finism for the ongoing provision of COVID-19 infection and vaccination information. Um, so methods, I examined a few existing publicly available ISAs. So um, I found a federal provincial territory ISA um, pertaining to public health information. And then I also found a data governance agreement between the University of Al Alberta and a couple of First Nations and Métis communities. Um, and that was um, pertaining to uh, tuberculosis research project that was conducted in that province. Um, I also reviewed relevant provincial and federal legislation. So you'll see the list there. I'm not going to read it out. Um, and then I modified an ISA template that was available on the Government of Canada website to make it applicable to a local First Nation context. So in the end, I came up with a modifiable template for use by a singular First Nation that would facilitate the exchanging of information with the government of Manitoba. Um, it's a two-way agreement. So the nation has to provide its ban list for the sole purpose of data linkage. The province can't use it for any secondary purposes. Um, the province then agrees to provide aggregated health statistics from a number of databases. Again, they're all listed there. Um, 
And the information will be analyzed and stratified by age, gender, and on or off reserve status. Um, it's intended to be an ongoing agreement subject to review every five years, and there will be annual exchanges of information. So some of the strengths of this project was the potential for tangible positive benefits for First Nations communities. Um, the data, data allows for community health needs assessments that inform effective service planning based on First Nations understanding of health and wellness. And it's a proactive measure to prevent further exploitation of First Nations with the rise of artificial intelligence, big data and public data. Um, some of the limitations are that, you know, a shift in power dynamics may be uncomfortable for the provincial and federal governments. Um, some resources are required for the legal negotiations between the parties. Um, there may be concerns regarding individual privacy with small sample sizes, and it would not capture non-BAM members that reside within the nation. So in conclusion, uh, the development of this ISA is a novel undertaking within the province of Manitoba that will facilitate the sharing of administration, administrative population health data with a specific First Nation. Um, it will have a significant positive impact on the ability of the nation to plan and implement needed health services. The worsening of health inequities in First Nations communities, um, the adoption of new legislation requiring governments to engage in reconciliatory practices, and the increasing importance of data sovereignty in the digital age provide a strong rationale for its development and implementation. Thank you.